dude, if you want to go down a marketing rabbit hole, I will go down a marketing rabbit hole with you. I think I'm the king of hiring and firing marketing companies. If you really try to push your team the entire year and it's a continual push, 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 are you winning? Are you losing? Are you winning? Are you losing over and over again? That just creates burnout and it takes the fun out of it. 2012 to 2013 was like the best time to start a CrossFit gym because you would just like open the door with a gazillion members because that's when everyone like needed to try CrossFit. And then when like the hype started to die down a little bit, that was when like ads were becoming popular on Facebook. And so you just enjoyed like three years of like dollar leads. And it was just an incredible like five year stint. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Gym World Worldwide. I am John Franklin, joined here today with my partner, the guy with the greatest hair in fitness, Mateo Lopez. And with us today is a very special guest. Someone slid into my DMs and said, hey, you got to talk to this guy if you are looking to talk to more people who are doing big things in the CrossFit space, which we are. And uh, this guy has some similarities to us. He started around the same time. He was in some of the same business groups. He used a similar strategy to grow his business. He was even in a very similar market, but we never rub shoulders. So you're going to hear us meet, shoot the shit and talk about uh, what it was like growing a CrossFit empire in the early 2010s. With us today is Daniel Davidson of CrossFit Mainline. Hello, sir. Hey, and welcome. thanks for the great introduction. And I'm going to challenge this. I think my hair is way better than Mateo's. I don't know, man. <laughs> but you leave, leave a comment. The one, leave day a comment I below. Just, the one day I didn't wear my Kilo hat or my Gym World hat, I was about to do it. I thought, you know what? It's fine. I got a fresh cut. But now I didn't know I was be fighting for my life here. So, I, <laughs> Hey, I'd be happy with either of your guys' hair. So I will take third place. But I got the best hat on today. So I got the, yeah. I, I got the Gym World Worldwide hat and matching sticker. I'm just going to wear both of these. Oh, there, there you, you go. go. There you go. So, so Daniel, uh, you we got started. We got started. In, we opened our first gym twenty twelve in Hoboken. Uh, I had no clue. Well, well I did. Tail wasn't a part of my life at this point. I had no clue what I was doing. Opened the door with um, over a hundred members, and it was uh, just like luck. I just ended up having a good space, picking a good market. And then um, and the power of meetups too, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'd been. I, 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 I did some. I did some. I was hustling and grinding to get some bodies in the door. Uh, parlayed that into a second location because um, Hoboken's like tiny. There was a you know you couldn't go and rent the warehouse next door because you know there there's a space crunch. And then we opened a second location way before we were bet ready. That one did even better than the first. We opened with over. I think 210 members in that location. And that was around the time I met Mateo. And, uh, you know, maybe about three months after that, that was when I realized, oh shit, I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, I'm in over my head. I got to figure this stuff out. Um, and it sounds like you had a, you had a similar story. So tell us how you came to open your first location and then end up with three. Yeah, it's very, it's very similar. Um, I got my start in the fitness industry back in the early 2000s in Nashville, Tennessee, working for D1 Sports Training, which you know now sold private equity. And I was employee number three with them and, and learned a ton. They were back around? They were, they were, D1 was around back then? Yeah. Yeah. They were around back then and they were just in Nashville. And, and my job was to go to each market where they were building and to sell memberships on site in a trailer in a dirt lot. And they hired a head coach and I had to teach the head coach how to sell. And I couldn't leave until I met, you know, a certain annual sales on them. And I learned it. <laughs> they, they, they left you in the trailer. They're like, Daniel, yeah. you live in this trailer and you don't leave this trailer. You want to get out of this trailer? You sell yeah. your way out of this trailer. That's it. And I would literally move my car from location to location to location and like fly home, you know, and then fly back out, you know, Monday through you know, Friday or whatever it was that I fly out there. And they were really just in the Southeast and it was really just the CEO, CFO, me and the Manning family at that point, you know? So, so you were the original gym launch. You were gym launch before, before Hermosi. You were the show up and sell guy uh, living out of a van. Yeah. And no kids at that point. So tons of flexibility uh, to do that. Uh, we moved up here 
from Nashville and Philadelphia like 17 years ago. So 2000, um, 2000 and I continued to work with D1 at that time and just kind of go all over the country. Uh, 2012 started our first location, but very similar, like, you know, just didn't do the research that a, a franchise would have done to tell me where to go and just opened up in a densely populated area in Ardmore, Pennsylvania and, and signed a lease that I thought I could afford. And luckily I could. And, um, I think our original equipment purchase was like less than $20,000 for the entire fit out and everything. It was like crazy and expensive. And, and we launched with over a hundred members a year later, uh, opened up the Wayne location, similar to what you did. And that was the point where I said like, Oh crap, I've got way too much liability. I need to figure this thing out. You know, like why are people continuing to come in my door and, and what can I do to continue to grow this and make sure that, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't fall apart. And that's when we hired business coaches and um, kind of went on our way to make sure we were setting this thing up appropriately. And, you know, one of my former coaches coined it as like we went from the wild, wild west to a company at that point, you know, of actual systems and, and ways to do things and hiring processes to do it. And of course, we lost some good people because of that. They wanted to be part of that wild, wild west of, of CrossFit. And we had to turn more into to a business because of the high rent areas that we were we were going into. So you were, you were, you basically had no systems, but both gyms were kind of packed out, right? Like you, was the second location just a, a success right off the bat, like the first one? Or was that, did that require a little more work? Yeah. I mean, it was over a hundred members right out of the gate. Uh, keep in mind, you know, like this is the beginning of the CrossFit days, you know, over a decade ago. So, you know, you could have luck opening up. Th- these were not light industrial warehouse areas either. These were high rent retail spots. So we had the, we had the locations locked down and that helped out a lot too. But yeah, over a hundred members and growing, you know, day one. 2012, 2013 were definitely the like two best year, like that 2012 to 2013 was like the best time to start a CrossFit gym because you would just like open the door with a gazillion members because that's when everyone like needed to try CrossFit. And then when like the hype started to die down a little bit, that was when like ads were becoming popular on Facebook. And so you just enjoyed like three years of like dollar leads. And it was just an incredible like five year stint. So if you're hearing this and you open a gym in 2017, 2018, 2019, as Daniel was alluding to it completely different. Absolutely. Just, you have to be way better. You have to spend more money. Your gym has to look better to, to get anywhere near a uh, hundred members in the door right out the get. I remember my first six months at Bowery, like we had, we were using Infusionsoft. I don't know what you were kind of running as a campaign or, or maybe it was just from the website, but like, it, I remember like my first three months, six months, it, you didn't have enough time at the end of the day to check off and call all the leads that were just coming through. It was just like, it's, it's ridiculous inflow of leads nonstop for not really doing anything. Um, and so, and then, yeah, as John said, when that stopped working, thankfully you could get dollar leads on Facebook for a while. And then that stopped working for a little bit, or it got really expensive when people started to, to copy that later into the game. So, but yeah, it was a different time, a different time. We've now moved. I mean, everything's now moved kind of where you got to be, you know, like where, you know, our competition now is the other micro gyms that are popping up in the area of franchises. So out go the light industrial and in comes more of a finished, polished CrossFit look, you know, which is what you got to do today, which costs significantly more money. And uh, you're, th- yeah, because you, you took a little while before going into your third location, right? Right. Yep. That was, uh, you opened that one like around COVID? We didn't open it, you know, coming out of COVID, we, <clears throat> you know, we're in these business coaching groups and we're having conversations with these guys, all that own gyms equal to our, you know, gross revenue size, because we all have the same problems. And, uh, you know, we're asking the questions, what are you doing that's working? Because I need to do it. And what are you doing that's not working? Because I need to avoid it, save as much money as I possibly can. And I took that a step further and I just began contacting local gyms. You know, the local micro gyms. And I just began asking the same same two questions. And it consistently popped back to me. Um, you know, I'm tired. I'm done. I don't think I can rebuild this thing. And then the conversation would turn to acquisition at that point. And it was not my original intent to contact these people and talk about, you know, purchasing their gym, merging them in, buying their brick and mortar or anything like that. But one of those locations was um, 
what's now our CrossFit uh, mainline Plymouth meeting location. And that owner and his wife had owned that gym for you know, probably eight years. Um, they have had, you know, like, okay, financial success with it, nothing to write home about. Uh, but they had business partners that originally invested and they wanted out. The business partners wanted out. And so I went in there and bought 100% of the gym. And uh, quickly, I mean, in less than a year, we you know doubled its gross revenue size just by putting in the right, the right systems into play. So that's how we acquired the Plymouth meeting location. The third location was through those conversations with gym owners that turned to acquisitions. So for context, uh, I'm going to pull up a map here so people can see. Uh, if you're not from Philadelphia, you may not know that. I think the main line is just like there's some old railroad, right? And it was like a yeah. prestigious like area a hundred years ago. And that's where all, this is where all like the rich commuters live, right? Like that's what yeah, it's the, railroad the main that line is. Straight out of the city and it stops every mile at every little town and then the homes are branched off of there and it runs right down route 30. Yep. Yeah. And this King of Prussia area here, it's where like a ton of offices are. Um, and, and it's also like a, a, a ton of like young people, right? Um, yeah, they, they, it's, it's, it's now what I believe is the largest mall in America. As far as like square footage for shopping is concerned, it's absolutely massive and they're building all of this, residential surrounding it but the problem you have with king of brush is everybody avoids it because the traffic's so bad to get around it yeah so you know going out there and opening up a gym yeah but people don't want to go out there unless they have to and then for context our gym was where this a is in philadelphia written here so we were we were only a couple miles away so all right and, and so the one you acquired sorry what year was that again we were we kind of jumped we kind of skipped like eight or nine years there um yeah. The, the, uh, the location number three. It's been two years since we, we purchased it. Yep. Okay. So we're 2022. So eight years, you were just uh, operating the two locations. I'm assuming. And everything was fine. It all went well. No everything problems. Everything was fine. It all years. went well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not a single issue. Just, uh, you know, stacking cash. You know how it is. It's all leadership. <laughs> it's all leadership issues at that point. And but like COVID is where you really started making your move, right? Like that's when you started thinking in terms of acquisitions or were you doing these bolt ons um, pre COVID? We weren't doing them pre COVID. We started and I've always been big about just having conversations with local gym owners. There's at some point, you know, where you're in your business, you know, experience or you're, you're you've worked long enough that you realize the guy that's two miles away from you, a mile away from you around the block, he may do something similar to you, but they're not competition. And you're okay talking to him and going over there and taking your team to experience their workouts and stuff like that. And so we've always done that. Um, you know, every quarter we take our entire full-time team off site and go experience some other fitness use, you know, and then they have to, we share coffee afterwards and they have to write in, they have to communicate to us like, what do they like? What would they change? And what are they going to steal? You know, and so we would do that and I would have these conversations and it just expanded after COVID and just getting granular on like, what are you doing that's working and not working? And, and that's when the pain really evolved from these gym owners and the, the bolt-ons just started to come rapidly. So it's funny you mentioned that because we, we did a very similar strategy. Like once a month, the entire team, we would go to another gym. It wasn't always a CrossFit affiliate. And a lot of times, if it was like a very large, successful gym, not only would we take a class, but they would hang out with us after, do like a QA and a and like literally share. Like David Osario, who I think runs one of the best affiliates, if not the best affiliate in the world, CrossFit South Brooklyn, like we would go over there, learn from him all the time. And he would just like an open book. We learned so much from that guy and did similar things with other places throughout the city. And then we were pretty strategic about, we would do like dinners. So we I, I'd throw a dinner with like five or six other owners and just kind of like shoot the shit. Um, for people who aren't, um, like we're going to talk a lot about bolt on acquisitions, which is a different strategy than we ran. And I'm curious to hear about it because it uh, seems a lot smarter and a lot less risky than what we did, which was we would look for kind of we had a checklist of what we thought were levers we could pull to make a gym from like break even, which was kind of like what we were targeting to 
to very profitable. And, and we would look through that. We try to identify them. And then we would just, hey, Mr. People, like, hey, you're looking to sell. You want to get out of this. And, and that was the strategy we took towards ex- expanding and going from two to five locations. Um, but what you did, uh, it sounds like you did that as well. Like that was the impetus for the third location. But but you would uh, find locations around your locations and basically buy the members, buy the coach, and absorb the equipment. It's kind of like I've, I've heard uh, Lifetime is doing something similar where they're just like basically buying gyms to shut them down and bring in the membership. So I'm curious, explain what a bolt-on acquisition is and and how that works for gym owners who may not be familiar. Yeah, Lifetime's doing the same thing. I've, I've had multiple conversations with their team over it. Um, it's just interesting the approach that they're taking. They're really after, they want talent. They're having a hard time getting the talent and then the members are kind of secondary to that. So these conversations just led to pains and challenges. Individuals wanted to move on with their lives, pursue another career. This was when you would just, hey, what are you doing? Like when you would just reach out to your competition, basically. Yeah, like, and they would just be like, I'm not doing anything. I don't even know if I want to get this going again. <laughs> yeah, what am I doing? I'm trying not to kill myself. Yeah, yeah. And we would typically we'd ask for, you know, their finances. And most of the time they don't have them. You know, um, I just looked at a gym down in North Carolina and the lady's been around like 13 years and she had like no finances to share with me. And I'm like, sorry, <laughs> like, I can't just buy it out of faith. So typically these gyms had like no, no finances. And we would say, can you give us admin access to whatever client management service you're working? And so whether it's Waterfy or Zenplant, it doesn't matter. And we would jump in and pull all the reports, trying to make it as simple as possible for them. And, you know, significantly under 100 members, maybe I think the smallest one we've done has been 25 and the largest one has been 70. So they're not going to have under under 100 members. And when we look at acquiring uh, gyms, we look at three different things. We look at do they have a team? Right? Do they have a team that if the owner goes away, that that team can run the business without the owner there? Do they have systems? Do they have systems that the team can run that can grow the gym and that can keep members there, right? And do they have policies and procedures, right? The biggest being, do they have contracts? Do they have contracts with their members so that when we buy this gym or merge this gym in, their members can't go anywhere? And most of the time, they have none of them. There's none of them. And I had a a business broker once tell me, that if you're going to look at those three things, you can literally look at it as like 1x, 2x, and 3x. If you wanted to look at that or multiple of what they what you want to buy, buy them out for, it's pretty accurate what you want. Wait, so most of these gyms don't have these things, right? Nah. All right. So a 1x is what? What, what would it, like? What's a 1x gym to you? And, and when we say x, you're, we're talking earnings, right? Yeah. And earnings, you, you can typically just look at what is the owner taking because they're going to suck everything out of the company. So um, you, those three things, if they have one of those three things, do they have a team that's full-time, somebody that can run the business if they're not there? Usually the answer is no, they've created a job for themselves. If they don't show up, change the toilet paper and leave the classes, the gym's not going to get unlocked or locked up. Uh, do they have any kind of systems? Do they have a CRM system? Do they have any kind of marketing system? Do they have a client value system? Do they have, do they have systems to attract people and keep people? And the answer generally is no, that leads are popping in off of some website and they're coming into an email and they're following up and they have no idea if people were new or not. You know? uh, and then do they have policies and procedures? Most importantly, do they have contracts for their members? Are people coming in and signing up for six months, nine months, a year? Uh, if they cancel, do they have to follow certain policies to cancel? Is there a 38 day note or 28 day notice or whatever there is, right? Do they have something? Most of the time, the answer is no. They don't have any of that in there. And so it typically turns to a straight out asset purchase. And I always phrase these conversations with them saying, like, I'm going to hurt your feelings. I hope that's okay with you. And they tell me yes. And then I begin to chat with them about, like, this is why it's an asset purchase. It's because of these things. And so at that point, what we ended up doing is – we end up saying, okay, you have, let's call it $10,000 a month in members, memberships that are paying you right now. You know, we will absorb those over to our gym and we end up paying a commission on those for 
a, whatever amount of time that we agree upon. Maybe it's three months, six months. Um, and we negotiate what that percentage is and the length of it generally based on how much of the equipment are we going to keep? You know, so that's the way that we are typically paying for the equipment. We're using their own cash to pay for the equipment there. And sometimes as through the conversations, we learn that this owner really just wants to coach. They just want a job. And do we have that for them? And, you know, we, one of the gyms we bought, we hired on the coach and she's been phenomenal. Our community loves her. And I wish we would have had this relationship a decade ago, you know, um, or sometimes they have a, you know, they just want a place for their members to go, you know, sometimes they're just like, pay me a commission on it. And I don't want to see any of the equipment. How can you help us? And we call our gyms and each one of them rents a U-Haul local to their gym and they roll up with the equipment list and they pile it in. And then honestly, an hour, all the equipment's gone. <laughs> and the person is just like, thank God, I don't have to deal with this. You know, and it, we move on with our lives. So to be clear, you're when you're doing these, you're shutting them down and taking the member list. We're shutting them down and we're merging the members over to our gym, giving them a plan. There's a, there's a, there's a process we do to do this so that we can maximize retention of these people that are coming over, you know, and I can walk you through what that process is and, and what we found success with and not what we've not found success with. And that's the, that's the term bolt on. So he has his gym and he is bolting on these other things. And that is what a bolt on acquisition is. Um, let's unpack Let's unpack the valuation thing there, because I do think that is uh, I think most gym owners think their gym is worth a lot more than it actually is. And I do. I've never heard it um, kind of packaged up like that. And I do think that's a smart way to think about it. So um, you had staff systems and like uh, basically revenue stickiness, like 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 contracts. And so each one of those is called the turn. So that, that increases the valuation. So let's assume you're an owner, you're taking 50 grand from your gym. If you got good staff in place, you get one X. So if you make 50 grand a year, it's worth 50 grand. If you got staff in systems, that's two turns. So your gym's worth a hundred grand because that's 50 times two. If you have staff systems and your members are on contract, that's a three X. So that's three turns. That means your gym's worth 150. Grand. That's what you're telling us. Yep. That's what I'm telling you. And I will say that from, I just had a conversation yesterday with a business broker and the business brokers will tell you the exact same thing that that's generally going to be what it is until you get to half a million dollars of net. When you get to half a million dollars, now you're looking at five to seven multiples. And at that point, it's really not worth selling because <laughs> you're making too much money. Right, I was just about it. to say, yeah. if you have yeah. those things and you're making that much, yeah, you know. yeah. Got a good thing yeah. going. And that's why this strategy is interesting because if you reach a certain scale, um, it becomes a lot more valuable. But you also just like once you're you can afford to hire good people at that size um, where like if you're at a one two location kind of situation, uh, you're still like one employee away from just getting sucked back into the mix. Right. Um, all right. And so it sounds like the bolt ons you were doing, you're essentially acquiring the gym's for free. And so if I'm listening to this and they're, you know, someone who's not used to it, it's like, why would a gym owner just give you the business for free? Uh, I'm assuming this is somebody who was like, if they didn't do this with you, they were just going to shut down their location. They're going to lose their security deposit. And then they were going to sell their stuff on Craigslist here. They're going to get some money for the equipment. They're going to get a little extra money as like a commission from the sale. And then it's like a guaranteed job on the other end. And I'm guessing there's an element of like my community, my members have a place to go. They'll still like, it'll, it'll be absorbed, but I don't have the stress of all, you know, a five-year lease and all these other things that make running a gym really hard. Is that, is that kind of the reason they would be into doing this? That's it. To be honest with you, the amount of money that they make off of the commissions in six months it's usually more money than they made in a year, you know, because they're not making 50 grand. You know, they're barely paying, you know, the bills of the gym, you know. So and if we give them a job on top of that, then it's significantly, you know, better for them from there on. Well, just how big are your facilities that you can absorb all these people all the time? So you mean by square footage? How big are they? I just like, I guess at a certain point, are you going to run out of room to keep uh, absorbing people or are you going to have to yeah, get another we'll gym? Our product at that time and shift like class time, like, you know, the length of classes and stuff like that. 
Um, our facilities are just under 5,000 square feet apiece. I'm trying to get them down to around 3,500. Uh, and we float around 16 to 20 people in a class, depending on the time of day. And we run a, you look at CrossFits and other group training facilities around us. They're running like eight, 10 classes a day. We run like five and we pack them out, man. And just creates the environment. And that's not to say we don't test things. We test things for four weeks at a time, but we preface it with the, with the community. If we're going to test this class time and we need to see a 60% occupancy or we need to see, you know, 16 people in a class on average, or we're going to test another time. And we just keep testing and, and we've just learned to keep our schedule as tight as possible. It helps with burnout of our team. And, you know, we're coming into summer and we'll shrink our schedule just for these three months of summer. And then we'll because everyone goes to the Jersey the Shore. Back. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes we don't even bring the classes back. Is pumping. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> people go away. I mean, they our kids program just disappears in the summer because these kids go to camp for like eight weeks. I lived on the Jersey Shore for a year and made friends with a CrossFit down there. Like on the big months down there, they would do like uh, like five to ten grand in drop in. So to to give people an idea of like the exodus from New York and Philadelphia in the summer, it's insane. I just one more follow up. Is this, so is this, is this your strategy for getting, do you do this instead of marketing? You just buy out gyms and their book of clients? No, this is part of the marketing, you know, dude, if you want to go down a marketing rabbit hole, I will go down a marketing rabbit hole with you. I think I'm the king of hiring and firing marketing companies um, because they rarely ever deliver. But the one we've just started working with is doing a really good damn job, but they're doing one thing vastly different. So I'm happy to, to chat about that. But this is, we will, in one of these acquisitions, we will easily hit our annual growth, if not double it, you know, just by absorbing one, one time in. And you run, you run traditional CrossFit model. So it's like the overwhelming majority just comes from group training, right? We don't do any personal training. We do zero. So it's all a hundred percent group training. We don't even do on, we don't even do foundations. We, um, it was a hundred percent group training. Yep. People sign up for one year. Yeah. And what do you, what do you charge? Like run us through kind of the economics of one of the locations, like, like a sample location. So, so you're sitting, we only count, we only count recurring athletes. So those athletes that are on contract with us, if you got 10 class pass or pay for a month at a time, you don't count. Um, so recurring athletes, a little over 200 per location sitting at, about an average client value of 175 uh, per individual. And then they spend about eight bucks on average a month in retail in each gym. And you're sitting at about 38% profitability per location. So let's see. So there's about 183, you said 200 bodies. So they're, they're like uh, mid thirties to like 35 to 40 range per location. And you're, you're pushing just under a 40% margin on that. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and I'm guessing part of the reason you can do that is, is staff related. If you're not doing on ramp or personal training, I'm guessing this is uh, it's pretty lean in terms of staff costs, which was the thing we always ran into. Yeah. We have one man, what we call managing partner at each location. That managing partner coaches no more than 16 classes a week. We find that floating them close to 20 is going to create burnout. So no more than 16 classes a week. And they end up, um, then running the entire like one-on-ones, new clients, signing people up the other 20 hours a week that they're in there. And so we fulfill the remainder of our coaching staff with either part-time paid people. And we have strict rules between that um, and what we call a head coach. And then we have what we call a bench coach. And a bench coach is someone that is, it's membership trade. They may coach one, maybe two classes a month. And it's really an emergency thing. It's like, hey, this person, this full-time coach needs to get out so they can see their kid go play basketball game, you know? And we don't, our expectations with a bench coach are are really, they're not low, but they're, they're not, they're, they're not going to, they're not there to teach and coach. They succeed because the community loves them. I mean, they've been around forever and people just love them and they're not going to be there every single day, but you know, coaching classes, but when they do coach, people send us emails and just say, I wish I could have him more often or her more often, which is great. Yeah. 
is this is this Betsy behind you here? Is that uh, is yeah, that my behind wife you? Is behind us right oh, here? The like, hair the hair looks uh, similar. From I know, that. I know. Um, Betsy was our chief of staff for almost eight years. She just left the company, which we're super sad about. Her husband owns an insurance agency, and she went to work for him. And she was really like my right hand person with all these acquisitions. You know, we went through it all together, and so she left in February and uh, end of February, and it's we slowed acquisitions at that point just because I needed to show the team some stability. I needed to make sure that their go-to person in Betsy was still there in me was still there in Chelsea. You know, they, they had someone they could text message and and ask things when, when they needed, needed help. And so we're still in that phase right now. We're going to come out of it at the end of Q2 um, and really go back into a growth phase again. But um, she was really the person that helped with a lot of these acquisitions. You need that warrior. Warrior. Go Taylor. Yeah. Let's hear it. She was the one who like um, dove in and did all the numbers and pulled everything. And then, you know, it was, it was a lot of, a lot of help. I'm curious about the responsibilities of this manager person, uh, because the staffing lineup and setup sounds very similar to some of the other gyms that we've, gym owners we've interviewed on this show who are doing the semi-private model, kind of the smaller uh, footprint, but very uh, profitable kind of model. Um, I know you said 20 hours of coaching for this person, then 20 hours of other stuff. Some of that's doing the one-on-ones and sales appointments. What other responsibilities do they have in those 20 hours? So they've got obviously a lot of like client retention. So any kind of, if you want to throw into that bucket, any kind of uh, cancellations or declined billing, things like that, they work the entire CRM, um, you know, we've got an entire white labeled uh, go high level that, you know, they're in for their unique location. Um, Although that's hopefully going to be going away. This new marketing company that we hired takes over the CRM and they've taken over our our more location CRM and are absolutely crushing the booking. So um, I'm hopefully going to pull that off. And, and we, we learn to take that off because every quarter we do, an evaluation of like how and when they spend their time. And one thing we learned from this last evaluation was around two, two 30, maybe three o'clock every single day, we all shut down. (laughs) We're like done. You know, like if you're an e-coaching in the evening, you're already in the gym, you know, getting ready. If you coach in the morning, you're tired by that time you're done and time with your family. So we needed to push that CRM in the, in the evening hours. So client retention, um, and also sales that they fulfill it with. So those two categories, And if we take off the CRM, then we're moving more into a, um, and we've been practicing this over the last two months, it's more of what we call hunting. And so it's how can they go out and generate leads uh, in the community, you know, without paid advertising is like that. So everything from meetups, as you guys mentioned before, to different events and things like that, working inactives, uh, upgrades, referrals, that stuff. And they have, we can get into all that. We have like a scorecard for them that has like specific numbers and metrics that they get judged on every single quarter. I like, um, for those listening, I had, uh, Daniel's staff page up and for those, uh, watching, you can see it, but I like the way you did this here where you have their endorsements and certifications listed out their education and then kind of the the stuff that the kind of like fun facts that everybody else puts on, but it's laid out in a way that's nice and makes it easy to consume visually appealing. So uh, go check that out. Steal that for your gym. We'll nugget there. I'll tell you that we have these up in the gyms. They're about two foot by two foot and they're up in the gyms. We also have referrals or um, reviews up all over the gym and like that too. But we chose those things because it starts conversations. Oh, you went to that school. I went to that school. I know somebody that went to that school. You know, so it's, it's a really great conversation starter. Of the demand generation stuff you're doing that's not, uh, you know, the traditional paid ads, what's working best for you right now? What's something a listener can steal and implement today, maybe maybe get a member? Man, you know, when you take a look at your year and, and you really need to take a look back at your like the last 12 months, good time to do that's obviously at the end of the year, beginning of a year. Take a look at that year and take a look at the ebbs and flows of that year. What what occurred? When did you grow? When did you lose clients? And align that with what happened in your life. When did you go on vacation? 
Did you have some kind of tra something tragic happen in your life? Did you lose a loved one? Did you have relationship problems? Did you lose a coach, you know, and take that and then really morph and align that into what your goals are in the next year. Uh, and so you can really push growth at certain points. And, and one of the things that we've really identified is that for our gyms, we really grow the first six months out of the year. And that is it. We grow by significant amounts in the first six months out of the year. And then after that, we average this billing cycle. Uh, my gyms are averaging one, two, and 4% churn, which is pretty freaking low. And we will cover the rest of the year. We will cover whatever our churn is, plus usually two athletes a month. We'll grow by two, grow by two, grow by two. And so identifying so that you can really push your team during those periods or push yourself during those periods. Because if you really try to push your team the entire year and it's a continual push, 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 are you winning? Are you losing? Are you winning? Are you losing over and over again? That just creates burnout and it takes the fun out of it. And so for us, we really push growth the first six months out of the year. And then the middle Q3 for us is the summer months. Everybody goes to the Jersey Shore. And so we really focus on serving clients and how can we better the gym and better their client journey and experience with us. And then Q4 is ramping for that next six months again. Let's get things in order for the marketing calendar and everything, get, get everything ramped back up again uh, for that next six months. So that would be my biggest takeaway is, is take a look back at the last 12 years or 12 years, 12 months and align the ebbs and flows of your business with your personal life and also the things that have gone on in the company and then decide how you're going to manage and push the company in the next 12 months. There was a little nugget in there and that was like, and we were guilty of this. Like summer, if you're in a big urban area, summer is going to be your worst uh, months. And that's usually where you're trying to hit marketing the hardest when people are least receptive to it. If I did a mulligan and if I was operating in an urban area, like I would just kind of, uh, I would focus on other stuff during those summer months and where I would hit marketing the hardest would be, uh, in that first part of the year when everyone is signing up like the busiest time. So back to school to, uh, winter was when it was, I, I don't know if those are the best months for you, but those are, uh, those are the ones that were the best for us. And and that's when you should be focusing your efforts and, and dialing everything on the marketing front, because that's when people are most receptive to buying. So I, I do think there is a, there is a nugget in there. So turning the page a little bit, uh, you recently bought uh, a building for a couple million bucks. Sounded like it was quite the journey. Let, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So original location in Ardmore, uh, it took about two years to find a building. It was right around the corner, of course, in an urban area, finding someone with parking, you know, important, standalone is important. Enough square footage is important. Uh, and it took a couple of years just because I, I had to create the relationship with the family that owned, owned the building. And it was, a, it was an old hardware store. And they were second generation of owning this hardware store. They were in their 70s, had no exit strategy for it. And we moved in and, and purchased the building. We financed it through the SBA. And it has, I mean, and, and I just, we discussed this offline. I, I, I mean, I've just got PTSD with dealing with the SBA and, and going through this entire process of dealing with the township and everything. Um, the SBA is just someone told me that going through this process was going to be challenging. And I was like, oh, I, I can handle this. It's been the most challenging, stressful thing I've ever done, mainly because of the errors that they've made in reviewing our finances that we've had to correct them on. My wife just spent half a day with them on site this week just to try to, because they needed updated numbers and they were misinterpreting them. And that's because of the management company and how we run things. But, um, also, um, just dealing with the township and, and I mean, I don't think there's a better word than corrupt to deal with most townships and, and we're having to file uh, a lawsuit against the township because they made us make changes to the building and cause delays with no zone requirement, zoning requirements, just because they wanted to, you know, and it ended up costing us significantly at the end of the day, not only in time, but also in, in money to meet their demands that, that weren't required because it's what they wanted out of the building in their downtown area. So we purchased this building. It's a little under 8,000 square feet. Uh, we, 
the parking lot's in the rear of the building. It's got frontage on the main street. Um, so you're talking tens of thousands of cars park past it every single day. And we segmented the building out. Part of the deal of financing was that I need to have a tenant for a certain square footage of the building. And so a little over 2000 square feet in the front is leased out to engage personal training, which I know you guys have chatted with before. Our buddy, Devin Gage. Yeah. Great guy. Great concept. We had, we walked multiple different tenants through there and the fitness tenants that we walked through there were all concerned that, you know, CrossFit's going to steal my people. And Devin was not, Devin was like, no, we're good. We don't have the same clients. No. And he's absolutely right. And they even park in the rear of the building and walk through our CrossFit space to go to their space, you know, so they don't, because there's no parking in the front. So, or they don't want to have to walk all the way around the block, which has been honestly a great relationship. Our people know them. Our coaches know their people. Like it's, we say hello, they cheer each other on. It's been a, it's been great. They've been there for uh, almost a well, in August, it'll be a year that they've been there and they're going to be there for five years. So, um, they're in the, in the front, like 2,500 square feet. And then we're in the back remainder of the space. We are, our floor is about 3000 square feet that we train on. And the rest is we really focused on, on the fit out of this one. We really focused on client flow of how do we push people through the space um, to maximize their time there. So how can I get them to spend two, three, four more minutes of time in the space? And that just resulted in a, in a layout with a, you know, as I call a tunnel that like walks people around the training floor. So they're not getting whipped by jump ropes when they walk into the, to the space. Yeah. So it's worked out really well for us. Uh, but at this point I'm, I'd like to purchase another building, but I'm kind of like burned out. <laughs> I'm dealing with the SBA. So uh, 8,000 square feet, Devin's, Devin's got, you said 2000 of it. Over 2000 in the front. And then the other 6,000, is your space. What'd you pay for the building? I think all in with tenant improvements were like at 3.25 million for the whole thing. And then the advantage of the SBA obviously is you don't have to put as much down. How much, uh, how much out of pocket did you have to put down to uh, buy this 3.25 million? <laughs> it's uh we put 10% down, which is great because you don't have to put as much down. Um, but of course, when you do that, you have to deal with all their crap. <laughs> And you did it. You did it at the right time, though. What's your? You have a ridiculously low interest rate, right? Yeah, we originally got qualified in like three and a three and three point seven five. Yeah. Oh. In there. So you're talking that you know our 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 rent for four thousand square feet around the corner for ten years was almost sixteen thousand dollars, and so we purchased the entire building for we pay less than that I think per month on on a mortgage. And for those listening, like the difference between a three and a half and a six and a half percent interest rate on a $3 million building, that's like 90 grand a year of just straight interest. So it's a huge, huge swing. Um, all right. So, you know, you got some scars. The problem you did, you did a 504, right? Instead of a SBA 7A loan. I remember you saying. Yeah. If I would have done a 7A, I would have been smoked with interest over the, you know, 2022 2021, 2022 timeframe. And what was, what's the difference? So for people who are unfamiliar, like what's the advantage of doing a 504? 7A is the most traditional, like the most common one. 504 is a, a little less common from the people we've spoken with. So um, yeah, why'd you go the 504 route and what advantage did that give you? So 7A is fast. You only need approval from the bank. The government approves the bank to make, knowing they're going to make good decisions. They don't even need the government's you know approval. They make the approval and they go. But a 7A is going to be a floating interest rate plus it's whatever you're sitting at for whatever interest rate they're pulling off of, plus usually a couple points that they're they're coming in at. Um, and there's no money down on it, which is the attractive piece of it. You know, uh, with the 504, you're going to put 10 percent down. Uh, the bank is going to hold 50 percent of the remainder of the loan and the government, the SBA, is going to hold 50 percent of the remainder of the loan. And the difference in the loan not only is going to be the interest rate because with the bank piece, you're usually going to lock in for seven years, but with the SBA piece, you lock in for 27 years. So for the entire life of the, of the loan, which is a big benefit too for it, you're not having to 
renegotiate that. So in six years, you're going to have to, or five or six years, you're going to have to refi one and a half million at whatever interest rates are at the time, right? The, yeah, the half that the, the that. bank owns. Yeah. Yeah. So that might, you might take a little hit there because I don't know if we're ever going back to three. Um, and, <laughs> yeah. and so do you, are you happy you did this? Like everyone that we've spoken to says, you know, buying the building was the best decision they ever made. You're the first person we talked to or like, I mean, this kind of sucked a little bit. Like I, I, I would do more, but I don't know. It just, I don't know if I want to deal with that much suck. Like, do you regret doing it or uh, do you feel like it was a good financial decision? You know, if you were to ask me that, Today, I'm going to tell you, I regret doing it. I regret doing it um, just because it's caused, it's just a lot of stress. You know, I mean, we, we talked about the SBA requirements and can I have, they're misinterpreting of finances and, and can I have this document filled out and, oh, use this template. Oh, we don't use that template anymore. Here's our new template and all of these different things going through and everything takes time for them to get back to you. But on top of that, you know, we had a, um, a phase two had to be completed on the property because it used to be, it was, it was downhill from a auto shop that a block away that, that it was the next place to put a well. And so when we were supposed to close on the loan, the DEP here in Pennsylvania changed over because with the new governor and it caused more delays and more delays and all this stuff. So, you know, at this point I would, I would tell you like, I probably would have searched out other alternatives now, if you ask me that in you know three years from now, five years from now, I'll probably tell you it's been the best deal that I've made because the ultimate goal here is that you know we, we don't want to operate these things. And, you know, I'm, I'm 41 years old. I don't want to operate these things when I'm in my 60s and my late 50s. And so the way that we position these managing partners is so that they have the opportunity to purchase these um, these gyms with no money out of pocket. And I can walk you through how we do that, but no money out of pocket, but they continue to pay us a fee to management every single month. And then we make our money off the real estate in the long term. Now the block up that, you know, tested positive for contamination is turning over to 500 apartments in the next three years with over 50,000 square foot of retail down below to expand downtown Ardmore in my direction. And we knew that buying the building, you know, there's going to be a 30,000 square foot grocery store going in. So, um, you know, who knows in three to five years, we may get an offer from a developer to come in and build townhouses on our spot. So, cause not only do we own the 8,000 square feet, but I own a 26 car parking lot, you know, right behind it, which is pretty valuable too. Yeah, they may knock your space down to build a parking lot. Yeah. And you know, heck I'll just, maybe I'll go, you know, find another home for my, my clients, or maybe I'll be the guy that gets merged in. You know, who knows? It's not unusual. So we've had two previous guests who that exact situation happened and had multi-million dollar exits from the real estate. And uh, one of them got to keep their gym. They they built a gym space for them in the new development. So and, and gave them three years of free rent. So they they uh, they crushed it. But yeah, it's uh, not unusual. So we'll see how this plays out for you. But yeah, it sounds you got to ask me pretty miserable. Years. <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been it's been a just a a rough go of dealing with banks and SBAs. And if I were to do it again, I would privately raise the money. I would privately All right, raise so the money. So explain how that would work. You want to buy your second location, how are you doing it? I would privately raise the money at, you know, eight, ten percent and back to the investors and you know, sell it off at probably entries of around a hundred thousand dollars and go from there you know, and then take my, to pay cash to get the, the either pay cash for the building or to get the 20% or 30% down in order to buy the building. And then I would take the lease to the bank to refinance it back out again after, you know, 18 months, 24 months from there, and then either pay out some of the investors or keep some of them, them in it. Sure. And if you do it, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk to you about the, the second one there. Um, all right. So you talked about your ultimate goal is to exit to your staff and you have a system for that. Walk us through and, and you keep referencing a management company. And, and that was my question. <laughs> Our management company is what we call the CF Collective. So it's Community Fitness Collective. Um, 
really that thing started because we were having conversations with these gyms. I would say, listen, I'm going to hurt your feelings. You're an asset purchase. This is what you're worth. And they would say, I don't, they, they'd get angry and they would say like, well, can you help me? And I said, no, I cannot help you because I don't want to be your business coach because you're doing everything. You don't have time to do, you only have time to do one of two things. You need to create solutions and you need to deploy the solutions. You don't have time to do both. You can do one or the other, right? Because you're doing everything in the gym. And so after a few of these said no, we ended up forging a relationship with one of the gyms. And I said, listen, pay me a percentage of your gross revenue. I'll look at your finances every single, Betsy and I will look at your finances every single week. We'll sit down and have a meeting with you for an hour and we will tell you what is on fire and what you need to deploy and what is come, what is going to be on fire in the next 30 days and what you need to deploy. And we provided the creative with them. So creative as far as like policies and procedures and leadership tools and things like that, you know, budgeting tools, things like that. And so um, we started for better lack of like managing these gents, you know, on the backside of it. And that's where the CF collective really like launched and started out of. And at one point there was like, I mean, there's probably about 14 gyms in it that we were working with, um, just on the side, deploying these solutions for them. Now there's only a handful and it's something we really got out of. And the reason we got out of it is the ultimate goal is to purchase these gyms and, we made it too easy for these gym owners. Like at, at about six months in, they were like, well, this is simple. <laughs> I'm done. Like, I don't need you anymore, you know? And then, you know, we'd hear from them like three months later, like something's on fire. They need, they need help with something here. Or they didn't know what they were going to do with their life when it came time to, for us to buy the gym. So they thought they knew what they wanted to do in their you know, second or third career. But when it came time to take the offer and exit, they they backed out because they just didn't know what they were going to do. And so now the CF Collective uh, is the management company. And so every single month with the gyms, the money goes to the CF Collective. And then the CF Collective from there pays all the bills of the gym down. And we do that from a simplicity perspective with payroll but also with expenses. It allows us to accurately allocate expenses because you have a gym that has – you know, 150 members uses resources um, at a different rate than gyms that have over 200 resources, whether it's payroll or whether it's toilet paper, you know, that, that comes in there. And so it allows us to our bookkeeper to actually say, OK, we instead of 33 percent of the website costs going to each gym, it's really this, you know, so we can get a more accurate number on the profitability of the gyms on a month to month basis. And are you taking, you said you take a management fee. So is a percent of revenue held within, you take a percent of revenue on top of everything passing through into the management company? So with the gyms that we manage, yeah, we take just like a franchise fee, it just depends between five and 8%. We take, you know, they, they just, re, we see all their stuff or admins on the back end of all their systems. So we see it and then we just invoice them, you know, charge their credit card every single month for the fee. We have, we found that that works pretty well and justifies the cost of what we're doing because as they grow, we grow. Sure. And, um, talk to me about this buyout. So how does it work? Um, how do you plan if, if one of these managing partners wants to buy one of the gyms in the future, how, how are you planning your exit? Cause it sounds like you're being pretty strategic about how to get out of it. Well, one thing that we know is that if you go to value one of these micro gyms, it's really worthless. You know, you're really an asset purchase and you're going to walk away. Most of these gyms are lucky to get one time their annual salary. If you get three times your salary, that's pretty awesome. But you only have three years worth of salary. So what are you going to go do? You know, you need to go find another job pretty quickly. So what we decided to do was create fan investment opportunities. And so every single the every single month, the compensation structure for the managing partner exists, consists of a base pay plus a percent of the gross revenue of the business. And um, that gross revenue of the business as their bonus, if they save it up, they can invest in the company and they invest in $5,000 increments. And it usually takes them you know, about half a year to accumulate five grand in, in, in bonuses with us and at five thousand dollars and i'm just going to use just just whole figures here at 
if their initial pay is a 1% of gross revenue bonus every single month, they pay $5,000 into the gym, their bonus goes to one and a half percent for, for then on. Then they can invest another $5,000 into the gym. Then it goes to 2%. Then it goes to two and a half and it caps out at three. And so they've purchased into the company. That money becomes mine. I keep that. They don't get any of that back. Now at 3% of the company, they choose, do they want to take 1%, 1%, 2%, 3%, whatever they want. And they take that money and we put it into a phantom investment account. And so it accumulates over time. And so if they want to, their first right of refusal to buy the gym, if they choose to buy the gym, then they can take however much money is accumulated over the years in that phantom investment account that becomes their down payment on the gym. And then they can use the credit lines as the, the remainder of the down payment of the gym. And where we really make our money is we continue to charge a five to 8% management fee. So the systems, the team, the support on the back end does not change. What they do does not change. How they report does not change. What creates success for that gym does not change. Their job does not change. So it eliminates the risk altogether out of purchasing this gym. So they're not in charge of creating all that again, right? The kicker there is that it's a retention tool for us as well. If they leave and go take another job, they lose it all. They lose everything. So that phantom investment account goes away that they have built up there. So the goal is that we make, let's say, you know, 250 to half a million dollars. And by the time that they do the phantom investment account, plus the credit lines that are going to be pulled out to pay, and then they pay five to 8% in perpetuity for the management of going forward. And then the real estate on top of that. Wait, so this 3%, like they're buying when they give you money, they are actually buying ownership stake in the gym or this, uh, this holding company or in that gym, it's a phantom investment into that gym. So their name is on no paperwork. They have no risk. Cause one thing we learned from them was they're like, I want to be treated like an owner. I want to be paid more when you make more money and the gym makes more money, but I don't want a cash call. <laughs> right? Like I don't want to be asked. I don't, I want my salary to be there. I don't want my money to be at risk. And so they buy into the gym in $5,000 increments. It caps at 20 K and that to us was significant for them, but important for us because it, they said, well, I've got $20,000 invested into this. Like I'm going to stay here, you know, invest a lot. But in reality, I've paid them that over time in their commissions and their bonus over the month. Right. So, but it's just, uh, it's basically like them putting it in a savings account to buy the gym. They're not actually buying ownership of the company at this point. It's well, they get a kicker, right? So as long as they stay, they're getting a, whatever that percentage of yeah. revenue. They get a and kicker. is there a predetermined yeah, valuation? Like how, how do you value the actual gym? Right. There's not like, a and predetermined do you do that every valuation. Year? We walk through this and, and there's not, I mean, if you, there's, there's really, there's not, man. Uh, I'm just not to that point. I, I, what I figure will probably happen is, is that I'll probably have an opportunity at some point in the next 10 years to sell these things. Somebody will approach me, you know, like I just said, I had a conversation with a broker yesterday that reached out to me from someone that's looking for a multiple gym opportunity in this region. And they, this, this managing partner has first right of refusal. They have the ability to say yes or no. But when they're so when they're putting in those five thousand dollar chunks for a larger percentage, is that five thousand dollar chunk? Does that entitle them to an extra half a percent, or was that just a number you made up? Or are you, or is it based off of some valuation metric that's determined? No, it's, it's just they, it's very simple. It enables them to get an extra half a percent in their bonus of the gross revenue. So five thousand is going to equate to half a percent regardless of what the business is doing is what we're saying. You got it. Yep. Yeah. And we set caps that they can only make $5,000 investments every, I think it's like seven months. They can't do it all at once. They can't just say, here's 20 grand we go and we have to accept it. And so we want to make sure that the company's growing at the right pace, they're the right fit in order to accept that because we don't want to have additional payroll costs go out if we're not growing and they're not performing the way that they should. And so, yeah, what, what happens if, you know, I understand 
as a retention tool, uh, what happens if you get in a situation where you need to replace one of these managing partners? How do, how do you unwind that? Well, they, they lose it. If they're not performing, they, they lose their 20 K that's, well, it's not 20 K. I mean, it could be, you know, 50 K if they've been here 10 years or whatever it is, but you know, I'm lucky in that in, you know, over a decade of doing this, you know, our, our first business coach really set us out right. And, and we meet up with these coaches frequently and, and every quarter we readdress, like, are they reaching, are they actually achieving their metrics that they're supposed to achieve? And the conversation we've had when they're not is, you know, what should we do if you cannot hit this metric? Right. And they'll say, well, I told you the solutions that I'm going to do. I'll do it. And our conversation goes, well, what should we do if you can't? And they will f- flat out tell you, I need to quit. They'll say, I need to quit because I'm just not doing what I told you I would do. And I've lost some good coaches because they flat out quit because they just couldn't do it. You know, they just chose not to do it. I'm still a little confused on what they're buying with these $5,000 payments. So this is it's a phantom investment opportunity. Uh, and it's phantom because they don't want any risk. These head coaches want to be an owner. They want to own the gym. They want to say they own the gym, but they don't want the risk of losing any money. They want to be paid every single month. So every single month they get a salary and then they get 1% of the gross revenue as a bonus. All right. So they can invest $5,000 into the gym, which takes them to from a 1% to a 1.5% bonus. So they get paid a little bit more because the gym's doing a little bit better, right? Then they can let that bonus grow and grow and grow. And no sooner than seven months, they can invest another $5,000. That $5,000 takes them to 2%. Then no sooner than seven months, they can invest another 5,000, 2.5% is their bonus now. And then no sooner than seven months after that, they can invest a final 5,000, which takes them to $20,000. That money comes to the company. It becomes mine. They don't see that anymore. It was the way that they bought into a position to have more bonus structure, more of the gross revenue of the company, more of the win, which is what they wanted without the risk. Yeah. So if you're, if you're coming in and you're like, I'm going to, I know I'm a hot coach. I'm going to bring in like X amount of additional revenue over this year. I want a chance to get more of that action. So I'm going to pay you a little bit of extra money to allow me to get more of the upside because I know I'm going to bring the value for this gym or whatever. Is that, I think that's kind of what you're saying. That is what I'm saying. But keep in mind, these aren't people that we've hired like yesterday. These coaches have been with us five Mm -hmm. to 10 years. You know, like they're, they're, they're the heart and the people think they own it. You know, they're the heart and soul of these companies. These, these aren't hotheads by any means. And so as that bonus accrues, so let's say they max out, they're at their 3% and that bonus is, so that bonus gets, you said that bonus gets paid out quarterly or monthly? Monthly. Monthly. And so do they have the choice of taking that bonus or does it just continue to accrue into this account? And the only like liquidity piece is if they actually buy the gym one day, that's the part I'm confused about. We take, once they hit 3%, we take 1% of that and they can choose to put more in, but 1% of that minimum and we put into a phantom account and let it accrue. And it just sits there and grows every month. Let's just say it's 500 bucks a month. There it comes. Boom, 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 boom. 500 bucks a month goes, 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 goes. All of a sudden I get a call. Someone wants to buy the gym. I think it's a good offer. I turn to the managing partner and I say, here's the offer. You have first right of refusal if you want to buy the gym or at any point they want to. You want to buy the gym. I want to sell. You have $50,000 sitting in this phantom account to go towards the purchase of the gym if you want to. So again, no it limits the risk. Then we say, okay, we are going to take a payment of $250,000 to buy this gym plus 5% of the gross revenue in perpetuity to manage it. So nothing changes for you. So there's no risk. We're not asking you to shift systems and CRMs. What works is works and what support you have is there. It's not going to change. Limit risk once again. So they, at that point, we say we're going to take $250,000. And their course question would be, well, where am I going to get the other $200,000? 
we would say we have credit lines available that are associated to the gym. You're going to pull out $200,000. Here's your budget. You can afford to pay it back in this time frame. So your risk, once again, is minimal. And so I walk away with $250,000, 5% of the gross revenue in perpetuity, and a bumper on the lease because I own the building. Got it. And then the the 2%, so the 1% stays in that retains that essentially the, the goal is that one day becomes a down payment. And then the other 2%, uh, they pocket that basically. And that's their uh, bonus in addition to whatever their salary is. You got it. Now, the retention piece comes in because if they leave the gym or we have to let them go for any reason, whatever they've accrued in the deposit is gone. They, they don't walk. I don't write them a check for that. It's gone. Got it. So that's like a performance. It's a, a, a golden, golden handcuffs, essentially. You got it. Yeah. Yep. That's it. Does that make sense, Mateo? Yeah. I guess. What if you never sell the gym? That money just sits there. Yeah. I mean, it could just sit there. If they don't want to buy it, it could just continue to grow. Right. These people that we have made these opportunities available to want to buy the gym one day. They want to buy it. A, a, a good example would be you know, the Plymouth meeting location. The guy and his wife who owned the gym prior to us buy, he stayed on as the managing partner. So he's our managing partner there. He's making significantly more money than he's ever made. And he's doing really well and enjoying it. And he even made the comment the other day on a team call. He's like, man, I wish I would have had all these team, all these systems and team support years ago, you know? Um, but he's made the comments that one day he would like to buy it back. And so this kind of opportunity goes to him. Got it. So, and, and, but they can't force a sale on you, right? No, I have to be willing to accept it. Yeah. Okay. So you got to push it. I guess I, I wrap my head around that. That is first, that is an interesting structure. Um, what's next? So we're at three locations. You're doing these bolt-ons, you're buying real estate. Uh, you know, it sounds like you want to build, you're, you're building to a point where someone gets interested. You know, it sounds like there's going to be an, a midterm exit is, uh, what I think your plan is. So, so what are you focused on right now? So we put, you know, gym acquisitions on the back burner with Betsy leaving and, and just showing our team that they can have support and, and we're going to be there for them to make sure we retain them. Right. Um, we continue to have conversations over acquisitions, but I've, we've honestly gotten really picky over them and what we, we want, you know, what do we need the cash flow to look like? What do we need the team to look like? Um, to be able to come in and, and purchase these, these gems. So the next step for us is be if bolt-ons exist and they're there and they're happening with the conversations, I'm having conversations with several, I run a list on the notes on my phone of all the gems to continue to have conversations with. And it's in my calendar of when to follow up with them on a regular basis, just to say, hi, how are you? How are you doing? Is there anything I can do for you? Um, so if bolt-ons exist and mergers, then we'll continue down that path. Uh, as far as, like brick and mortar acquisitions, if it exists and it's there in the terms that we want, we re I recently just turned one down about an hour away um, just because the terms weren't right for us. Then we'll continue to to buy those brick and mortars. We've got the the system down pretty good. It's like you guys, you know, when when you would move in, you're like, listen, all we you know, we check these boxes, we're gonna win. You know, we just gotta check these boxes. And so we know that if we put those boxes into play and we check them over and over and over and over and over again, then we're going to win. So just making sure we have the right brick and mortar for that. But I don't want, you know, like I, someone asked me this other day, I was like, I don't want to start a gym from scratch. It's like, I don't, I don't want to go start something new. I'll, I'll buy something because I'm going to have one of those three things. At least when I buy something, I'm going to have a team, I'm going to have, policies and procedures. I'm, you know, I'm going to have contracts. I'm going to have something right. That's going to help launch that thing. Existing cash flow, a facility, a lease, something. Yeah. I, I definitely, uh, would never start a gym from scratch again, but, uh, definitely get it as someone who's done both. I feel like the people who, who've done the acquisition route probably will never go back from that. Franchises are something too. That's like intrigued me over the last few years. Um, but I mean, they come with their own headaches too. You know, you're, you're, you got handcuffs, you know, the, the, the franchises that we work with, you know, that are either in our business coaching group or have reached out to us for support. Like, th th I mean, they get their you know hands slapped on a monthly basis for things that they need, need to do, but can't do. 
which is tough too. Right. Cause they have no control over their, or they have limited control over what they can and can't do. So right. Probably better yeah. word for it. Yeah. So acquisitions are still there. It's something we're going to pursue. It'll probably pop back up September, October. We'll start to push a little bit harder for those. Rocking. And where do people go if they want to find out a little more about you? Yeah. So I'm really hard to find. <laughs> I've never posted anything on social media. <laughs> Although I'm on there for the, for the companies. Um, I'm not listed on our website. And that's intentional because I don't want our members to know that, you know, I want, I want our members to think that the managing partner owns the gym and they do, you know? So, um, to find me, you can just send me an email at Daniel at CrossFit And I'm more than happy, you know, every time we, we chat and we do one of these, these podcasts, we'll get a few reach outs. You know, for instance, we've got a letter that, um, we send out to these gyms for these acquisitions that, it has an over an 80% response rate back to us to start the conversation over the mergers and the brick and mortar. So uh, we've sent that out a few times, but if you send me an email to Daniel at CrossFit then um, I'm more than happy to, to help you out any way I can or share knowledge or learn something from you. You know, there you have it, Jim world, Daniel, thanks for making the time. And uh, if you got value out of this Jim world, be sure to like subscribe, leave a comment and uh, we'll see you as always next week. Goodbye.